In this PowerPoint, we'll begin discussing the periodic table. This is an incredibly powerful tool in chemistry. You can tell a lot about an element just based on its position on the table. We'll begin by looking at some of the basic organization patterns, but we'll return to this topic several times throughout the semester and add more patterns as we continue to refine our understanding of the elements. The periodic table organization is governed by the periodic law, which states that the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. So what does this mean? It means as you arrange the elements in order of increasing atomic number across the rows of the periodic table, you see repeating patterns of properties. And that's what periodic actually indicates, a regularly repeating pattern. The rows are arranged in such a way that elements with similar properties are then found in the same columns or regions of the periodic table. When we refer to the periodic table, we usually call the rows periods. As you go across a row, each element in that row actually increases an atomic number by one and you see a gradual transition in the properties of those elements across the row. Elements usually have very different properties at the beginning of a period compared to those at the end of a period. The vertical columns on the periodic table are called groups or families. And here you'll find that the elements in one column generally have similar properties, particularly in how they react with other compounds. So one of the major properties that we see a gradual transition in from one side of the table to the other is metallic character. Most elements are actually metals and they're found on the left hand side of the table. They comprise the greatest portion of the table. And what it means is if you find an element um, in this region of the periodic table, it's going to have the characteristic properties that we're familiar with for metals. That means that it's likely to be shiny, um, it's malleable, which means it can be easily shaped like into these gold bars. Most metals are usually solids. There's one exception and that's mercury. They're also good conductors of both heat and electricity. And a property that you may not be as familiar with, but it's actually one of the most important for you to know, is that metals, when they react to form ions, tend to lose electrons to form positive charged atoms or cations. On the right hand side of the table, we have the nonmetals. And as the name implies, their properties are defined by not being a metal. So when they're found in solid form, they tend to be dull and brittle, the opposite of a metal. We can see that with the picture of sulfur at the bottom here, which uh, breaks apart easily into flakes or powder. Nonmetals actually are found in all phases at normal temperatures and pressures, and many of them are gases in their pure forms. They are all poor conductors of heat and electricity, and finally, one of the most important properties for you to know again, when they, re when they react to form ions, they tend to gain electrons to form negatively charged atoms or anions. In a zigzag line between the metal and the nonmetal regions, we have the metalloids or semimetals. They're colored purple on this table. These are substances that display properties of both metals and nonmetals. A good example of this is silicon. Silicon is definitely shiny in its pure form, pictured here. But it's also brittle and breaks easily. It can be a good conductor of electricity, but it's definitely a poor conductor of heat. The periodic table can also be broken down further into regions. Groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18 are all known as the representative elements. While groups three through 12 are called the transition metals. The two rows in pink at the bottom 
are known as the lanthanide and actinide series, and they're actually part of the transition of metals as well. And oftentimes you'll hear these referred to as the inner transition metals. Now these groupings actually reflect patterns of electron structure, which we'll talk about later in the semester. Within the representative elements, we can also identify important families or groups of elements to know. Column one corresponds to the alkali metal family. These are all soft, very reactive metals. And here you have a picture of sodium metal stored under oil. It's kept under oil to keep it from reacting. And here is a picture of what happens when it does react. This is sodium metal actually added to water. It actually releases hydrogen gas from the water and a lot of heat, which then ignites the hydrogen gas, creating the fire. So these metals are not commonly found in pure form in nature because of that high reactivity. You'll also notice that hydrogen, which is at the top of column one, is not included in this family. This is because it's not a metal. It's often placed in column one, however, because it shares the other important property of alkali metals, which is that it, they tend to form ions with a plus one charge. So hydrogen is one of the few non-metals that can form a positively charged cation. Column two on the periodic table is also known as the alkaline earth metal family. So these metals are less reactive than the alkali metals. They do still react with air and water, but much more slowly. Most importantly though, when they react, they all form cations with a plus two charge. On the non-metal side, we also have the nictogens in column 15. The most important property that these elements share is that the non-metals in this column all form anions with a minus three charge. The chalcogens, which can sometimes be referred to as the oxygen group, are in column 16. And here, all the non-metals form anions with a minus two charge. The halogens are in column 17, and these elements all form anions with a minus one charge. And finally, in column 18, we have the noble gases. These are also known as the inert gases because they don't react with anything generally. As a result, we have no characteristic ion charge. The ion charge relationships on the periodic table are some of the most important for you to know. They underlie our understanding of the formation of a very important class of compounds, the ionic compounds. So here's another picture of those ion charge relationships, and we see those families that we just discussed with their characteristic ion charge symbols, plus one and plus two for the alkali and alkaline earth metals, minus three, minus two, and minus one for the nictogens, chalcogens, and halogens zero charge on the noble gases. The elements in columns 13 and 14 aren't as easy to predict in terms of ion charge. So here we have only represented the two elements that do form a characteristic ion. And so the, that includes aluminum, which always forms an ion with a plus three charge, and carbon, which when it does form an ion, does so with a minus four charge. We also have some of the more common transition metals and their charges included on this chart. Notice that there is no clear pattern for these metal ion charges based on their position on the table. Many of these transition metals and the heavier metals that are found at the bottom of column 13 and 14 form ions with a range of charges. For example, chromium can, found, can be found generally in two forms, either chromium with a plus three charge or chromium with a plus six charge. Iron, in the same way, can be found either as a plus two or a plus three. We usually say then that the transition metals exhibit variable charge ions. 
In summary, the periodic table is organized in horizontal periods or rows by increasing atomic number and groups or columns by similar chemical and physical properties. There are several important organizational schemes for you to know. The regions of the periodic table that correspond to metals, metalloids, and nonmetals, representative versus transition elements, the important families on the table, and ion charge relationships.